the air with that absolutely desperate race against the clock to save the five people on board that missing sub, a needle in a nearly blackout haystack, time and air running out as we're getting new details about the sub itself, who's in it, and what the Coast Guard's doing to try to find it. Also tonight, the new accusations from Republicans that Hunter Biden, they say, is getting a sweetheart deal. His lawyer says that's not true. We've just heard from President Biden. We'll tell you more about that and what else we're finding out about that plea agreement for the president's son. Then the Vatican out with a new report calling on the Catholic Church to get behind radical inclusivity, to embrace diversity, especially in the LGBTQ plus community. So is that going to make a difference? Plus a new call to action from a big name public health group pushing doctors to test everybody for depression and anxiety. Just how you check for that is the big question. And in tonight's backstory, a look behind the curtain at our team's extensive interview with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the anti-vaccine activist and Democratic candidate for president. Why our reporter says this was a decade in the making and what most surprised her about her hike with RFK. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight we are learning the five people inside that missing sub trying to tour the Titanic wreckage have only less than 40 hours of oxygen left tonight in what is now becoming this desperate race to try to find this thing in an incredibly harsh environment that's more like outer space than planet Earth. They are basically looking for a needle in a pitch black haystack. It is so dark down there, you can barely see your hand in front of your face. There's unbelievable pressure from how deep it is, with rescuers dropping sonar buoys to try to listen for this submersible, which could be up to two miles under the water. And just in case it's actually surfaced and can't get anybody to notice it, you got the Canadian Coast Guard flying planes like these to see if they can spot it. We've also just confirmed the Air Force is sending C-17s to help move equipment for this rescue. NBC News has now learned who all five people are on this sub. Stockton Rush. He's the CEO of the private company that runs this trip called Ocean Gate. French diver Paul Henry Narjolet. Prominent Pakistani businessman Shazda Dawood and his son Suleiman. British billionaire and explorer Hamish Harding is believed to be on board as well. They all descended to check out the Titanic wreckage in this tube. Basically, look at this. This is the super tight seating. This is how Ocean Gate says its passengers typically sit. You can see just how little room there is on this thing. It's tiny. It's really only a few feet longer than a minivan, about 22 feet in all. It can get to about 13,000 feet underwater. For comparison, the best Navy sub can only get to about 2,000 feet under the surface. There's a little toilet on this thing, a really small bathroom. It's separated from the main part by a curtain with, in all, four days worth of emergency oxygen that's reserved right at the start. Again, that is now down to an estimated 40 hours or less. It's not like this thing inside is super duper high tech, at least not visibly. Look at this little button. CBS's David Pogue was on a ship like this, a submersible like this, when the CEO showed him this kind of elevator button. The sub itself is run by, look at that, a controller that looks like something off Xbox. And in a podcast interview, Stockton told Pogue his greatest fear is basically what is playing out right now. Listen. Once we're down there, what are the things to worry about? So what I worry about most are things that will stop me from being able to get to the surface. Overhangs, uh, fishnets, entanglement hazards, and that's just a technique, you know, piloting technique. You, it's pretty clear. If it's an overhang, don't go under it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if, uh, if there's a net, don't go near it. So um, you, can, you can avoid those if you're just slow and steady. Again, we don't know what is happening, what could be happening down there. Christian Dahlgren is live for us from Boston. Um, this is an extraordinary circumstance, Christian, with all of these rescuers trying to find this sub. They don't know its status or where it is. Right, and you really did a good job laying out, Hallie, the complexity of it, of searching for this needle in the haystack. You have so many things working against you. The location of the Titanic, uh, that it's 13,000 feet down, that it's 400 miles or so from Canada where they are launching some of these vessels and, and some of these aircraft. They're now searching in an area that's bigger than the size of Connecticut because while we know it was headed down to the Titanic, we don't know what happened down there and whether or not the ocean currents may have carried it uh, somewhere else. So a huge area to search and, and then huge depths to search as well. So there are these robotic uh, operated vehicles also looking currently. And then after the search, when they find it, what are they going to do? There are not many vehicles that can get down to that depth if it is still at that depth. So our Tom Costello asked the Coast Guard about that. Take a listen. 
if your submersibles can find this sub, is there any way to retrieve it and save the people on board? We have a group of, of uh, our nation's best experts in the Unified Command, and if we get to that point, uh, those experts will be looking at what the next course of action is. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing that, Hallie. But basically, you know, the answer to the question, can you get it after you find it? And the answer is, I don't know. So that as this desperate search continues, yeah. and now by my calculations, down to about 36 or 37 hours right. of air estimated left on the submersible. Hallie? I mean, like a day and a half at this point, Kristen. I don't know if you can still hear me. Just give me a nod if you can. But one of the things that we talked about was David Pogue, that CBS journalist who was with the CEO, David Stockton. Um, and, you know, at this point, you heard Stockton speculating last year on this podcast what could happen under the surface of Sorry, the ocean. Sorry, Helen, can you having tell trouble us? Uh, hearing you. We are redialing. Got it. We're going to see if we can wait and get Kristen back as we're showing the names of these five people on this missing sub. You can see them. That's Stockton Rush. And what we'll ask Kristen is to talk more about this in just a second. Stockton Rush, the CEO there, that prominent businessman from Pakistan, the adventurer and billionaire from England, uh, and then, of course, a French Navy diver. I think we have Kristen back now because, Kristen, I was going to ask you to talk a little bit more about specifically the CEO, the people on board. This is, a, this is a trip that's extremely, obviously, expensive, but you go down to see this incredible sight, and that's the wreckage of the Titanic. There are obviously dangers and risks involved. Yeah, and obviously a dream that these people had. I mean, uh, for someone like me, you, you look at it and you say, well, I can see that in a movie or, you know, on a documentary. But for a lot of people, seeing it in person, if they have the means, is really a lifelong dream. And so presumably uh, for many of these people, it, it was. I mean, you talk about Hamish Harding, the British billionaire that was on board. He had been to space as well. So this is sort of his MO, searching out these extreme adventures uh, here on Earth and beyond. And so that is something that he was doing. Uh, we learned a little bit more about the British Pakistani family, the father and son. He's 19. Uh, university student. His father had spoken out at the United Nations on International Women's Day. So, you know, uh, again, um, people who, you know, ha had done a lot and contri have contributed a lot to society. And then there is Stockton Rush, who, uh, you know, has had several businesses before, has this fascination with diving. It's interesting. My brother's actually a prominent marine biologist, and mm. Stockton had been reaching out to him about doing some research in the Bahamas and perhaps running on the off-season and uh, some of these submersible expeditions in the Bahamas to some of the depths there. And, um, you know, my brother got a tour of this submersible. And the one thing that stuck out to me that he told me about it, he said, um, you know, while he hadn't dove in it, he said, it is much smaller than you expect. And, and yeah. I can't help but thinking about those people today, the five of them in that tiny space together uh, as, you know, they know that it is really a race to find them in, in time, you know, and obviously we don't know what happened to them. Them yeah. yet, but a uh, desperate search tonight, Hallie. And the details just so uh, incredible, truly remarkable. Kristen Dahlgren, thank you for being there. We're going to check back in with you in just you a little bit. Appreciate it. It may be the last 30 minutes, not even. We're hearing from President Biden for the first time on camera about that federal plea deal for his son, Hunter, that could let Hunter Biden avoid prison time. Listen. I'm very proud of my son. I know it's tough to hear there. You had a reporter shout a question. The president responded saying he's very proud of his son. Republicans are not pleased at all with this deal. Like former President Trump, who, of course, himself is facing 37 federal counts related to that classified documents investigation. He's calling the Biden plea deal a traffic ticket, a scam, he says, with the DOJ. Here's House Speaker Kevin McCarthy echoing that. If you were the president's leading political opponent, the DOJ tries to literally put you in jail and give you prison time. If you are the president's son, you get a sweetheart deal. Late today, MSNBC's Katie Turr asking Hunter Biden's attorney exactly that. Does he think it's a sweetheart deal? Listen. I've heard Speaker McCarthy say a lot of stuff I don't agree with. There was no basis for what he said, and he's not right. Court documents just revealed today show the younger Biden is expected to plead guilty to two federal misdemeanors for not paying something like $100,000 in taxes in 2017 and 2018. Prosecutors may also dismiss a separate gun charge if Hunter Biden goes through a pretrial diversion program. 
Two sources say the Trump-appointed federal attorney overseeing this case will probably recommend probation in this instance. We're going to get to the politics with Ryan Nobles in a second, but I want to start with Ken Delanian, who's live for us in Wilmington, Delaware. So, Ken, explain how this prosecutor, again, a prosecutor appointed by Donald Trump, is explaining this plea deal. Well, Hallie, this is the result, the culmination, really, of a five-year investigation into Hunter Biden's business affairs, including the millions of dollars he was paid by Ukrainian and Chinese business interests. No charges filed as a result of that, but he also failed to pay taxes in 2017 and 2018, and he's pleaded guilty to these two misdemeanor counts of willful failure to pay taxes. It actually is as much as a million dollars that he repaid two years ago in, in an effort to try to settle these charges. So a significant admission of criminal wrongdoing, but misdemeanors, which carry 12 months each in prison. And as you mentioned, the prosecutors are recommending uh, no jail time at all in this case. And so this is what's got Republicans upset. They see what looks like a gross conflict of interest to them. But things that can be a conflict of interest are not necessarily criminal. And we're told that the FBI and other agencies really looked hard at not just these tax issues, but all kinds of issues around Biden's uh, business affairs. And it's really hard to judge whether this is a lenient deal or a tough deal, unless you know all the facts, unless you know what else prosecutors could have proven. Because this was a negotiation, after all. And we, we reported for, at NBC News that there was at least one felony tax charge on the table that we didn't see brought there today. So, you know, you have some on the left saying that Biden was, uh, he was punished, essentially, for being the president's son, and that this was an onerous plea deal. Obviously, you have people on the right saying it was a traffic ticket. So only the prosecutors and the defense lawyers know for sure what this deal was, Howard. We, we, the court documents do not mention any allegations that are being made by Republicans, questions they're raising about Hunter Biden's alleged ties to other countries. You flagged this phrase from a federal attorney, that this investigation is ongoing, right? This investigation is ongoing. Here's Hunter Biden's attorney on that. Listen. He didn't do anything that has been the source of any charges after a five-year investigation by the Department of Justice. Is this the end of it? My understanding is that we're done. His understanding is that they're done. Is that the understanding of the Justice Department? Do we know yet? Do we have any reporting on that front? Yeah, the reporting that we've done today suggests that they are done as regards to criminal liability of Hunter Biden, because it stands to reason Hunter Biden's attorneys, well, he said that, would not have cut this deal if they thought their client was still facing potentially other charges. But what's right. pretty clear is that there are other related aspects of this investigation that the U.S. attorney says are still under investigation. That's why he said it's an ongoing matter. There could be other individuals that they're looking at in relation to the whole saga. But um, in terms of Hunter Biden, we don't envision, uh, and there are law enforcement sources telling us, you know, it appears that this is the end in terms of this five-year investigation. Ken Delaney, live for us there in Wilmington, Delaware. Ken, thank you. I want to bring in Ryan Nobles, who's live for us on Capitol Hill. And Ryan, let's show you here the political fallout, right? Because 2024 Republicans who are hoping to get the White House are jumping on this. We saw former President Trump call it, as we said, a traffic ticket. Governor Ron DeSantis, a sweetheart deal. Senator Tim Scott, a slap on the wrist. A joke, says Vivek Ramaswamy, former Governor Asa Hutchinson, who's been in a different place for most of his party on a lot of topics, says it is an important step. Um, but it sounds like investigations are only going to ramp up into the Biden family on Capitol Hill where you are. We know that the House GOP has already launched multiple investigations. Yeah, Hallie, from the very beginning, uh, House Republicans in particular have, have made it clear that they did not feel that the Department of Justice's investigation into Hunter Biden was sufficient in their mind and that they were going to continue uh, to look into these allegations of a potential bribery scheme, a potential influence peddling, of which the president's son, they believe, was at the center of. And this is what the House Oversight Chairman James Comer had to say earlier today. He said these charges against Hunter Biden and the sweetheart plea deal have no impact on the Oversight Committee's investigation. We will not rest until the full extent of President Biden's involvement uh, in the family schemes are revealed. And to that end, uh, James Comer, uh, the ranking member on the Oversight Committee, Jamie Raskin, were just behind closed doors, about two floors below me, uh, taking a look at the supplemental tip sheets, these FBI forms uh, that were generated around this investigation uh, into Hunter Biden's business ties in Ukraine, of which Comer has said uh, is explosive and is a huge problem. Uh, on the other hand, Raskin has said that they took that information and it went no further. Uh, the sum total of all this, Hallie, is that House Republicans may, are not done investigating uh, Hunter Biden, even if the Department of Justice is. 
And there are Republicans who want to make this an issue on the campaign trail. We showed some of what President Biden had to say in the past. He said his son is innocent. I will tell you that in nearly every conversation I have with Republican sources, depending on the topic, but in a lot of them, they bring up Hunter Biden. Yeah, and, and, and in large part, Hallie, that's because the, the messaging against Hunter Biden has been somewhat effective, particularly with independent voters. Take a look at uh, some of these statistics that we can show you uh, as it relates to what Americans think about Hunter Biden. Uh, clearly, they believe, uh, if you're a Democrat, that the investigation into Hunter Biden has been fair, uh, that uh, there isn't a problem there. Uh, but uh, Republicans believe that it's unfair. And you see with those overall numbers, 26% saying unfair, 36% saying it's fair, but 38% aren't sure. Uh, let's take a look at the next uh, graphic to, to kind of further drill down this point uh, about, in general, what Americans think about the Hunter Biden situation. Uh, you know, the question is, uh, do you think that they are fully investigating uh, the situation with his laptop and his foreign business dealings? Look at that overall number. That's important. 45% say yes, 55% say no. Obviously, that changes a lot when it breaks down in the partisan breakdown, much more uh, you know, leniency with Democrats. Uh, Republicans feel it's not going far enough. But, Hallie, keep in mind, with those independent voters, they're the, going to be the ones that decide the 2024 race in those key swing states. If this impacts those voters just a little bit in some of those states, it could have a big impact on the 2024 election. That's why you can bet that the Biden campaign and the president himself are hoping to put this behind them as soon as possible. Yeah. Ryan Nobles live for us on the Hill. Ryan, thank you much. Also new tonight, the very first ever so slight signal that maybe Maybe support for former President Trump is starting to erode after he was indicted for allegedly mishandling classified documents. There's this new poll out in just the last couple hours showing Mr. Trump now leading Florida Governor Ron DeSantis by a 21-point margin. That's a lot, right? But look at the comparison to back in May, CNN's most previously recent poll. Down six points there. That movement is inside the margin of error, but we want to bring in Vaughn Hilliard on this. Big picture is still a big lead for Donald Trump, but maybe a data point. Too early to tell if it's one of multiple data points, but it is certainly um, potentially a signal. Right, Hallie. And look, 47% of the Republican electorate, that's still significant here. And that is the struggle for this crowded GOP field. But when you open up this poll, his favorability among Republican voters dropped in this poll from 76% to 67%. At the same time, one quarter of Republicans said that they believe that Donald Trump should drop out of the race, meaning 75% said that he should stick around. These are still strong numbers when we're looking, we're being a about six months out from the Iowa caucus. But as you said, the softening is significant because it is the evidence that these candidates, including Ron DeSantis, need to suggest that it could still be an open game here. Vaughn Hilliard, thank you so much. All of it, of course, is the judge has set that trial date for August 14th. Legal experts expect that to be pushed back. Appreciate it. To weather now, because really bad storms and incredible heat taking another swing at the south tonight. You got around the Gulf, millions of people looking at the possibility of intense winds, big hail, maybe even more tornadoes. And right now, it's New Orleans that's prepping. In Texas, you see it here, they're staying dry for now, but it is so hot, it is so hot. 30 million people seeing a heat index of at least 105. That's like mid-July, August stuff that they're seeing here in mid-June. A lot of the South is still reeling from those tornadoes that swept through over the last couple of days. Look at this, houses in Mississippi, people are just starting to pick up the pieces. Tens of thousands of them still do not have power. I'm joined by NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns, but I want to start on the ground in New Orleans with Blaine Alexander. This is a city that understands what it's like to get hit by storms. Tell us what the sense is now with, with folks there getting ready for another round of severe weather. Well, the big concern here, Hallie, is rain and, and potentially lots of it. You know, we actually just came uh, from Lewin, Mississippi. We were just there, made the three-hour drive down south to New Orleans, and we actually drove through some of that rain. We're talking about heavy downpours, and that really is the biggest concern. Of course, it's under a threat for severe thunderstorms, so that brings with it gusty winds. We're already seeing the winds start to pick up and frequent lightning strikes. The good news, though, is that we're not expecting to see the type of outbreaks that we've seen kind of sweep across the south in the past five days. That 
risk is relatively low. So when we talk about possible tornadoes, the good news is that's not necessarily the big concern here. But when you go a little further north in places like Mississippi, even places like Texas, yes, they are still very much cleaning up after those tornadoes blew through. Lewin, Mississippi really is the prime example, Hallie. I spent more than a day there, about a day there, talking to people there and really just kind of surveying what is the worst of that damage. We're talking about winds that were ES3 tornado strength, so strong enough to pick up a tractor trailer, throw it down the street and land it elsewhere, um, and strong enough to leave houses unrecognizable. We spoke with one gentleman who was inside the house. He miraculously survived with his wife, but when you see the way his house looked, you'll know why it's a miracle that he walked out unscathed. Take a look. Boom! Boom, boom, boom! Tin and 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 wood cracking and breaking and felt like like a a, a, a giant was hitting the house with a sledgehammer. Ten thousand handyman. It's gonna take that to fix this community, and I mean in every facet of construction. And it's ironic because he is a handyman himself, and he just said, hey, he's going to need a lot of help when he even gets close to trying to rebuild. The other piece of all this, Hallie, you talk about severe weather, rain, tornadoes, that type of stuff. The other side of this, though, is the heat. So some of these very places that are trying to clean up from the storm damage, they're dealing now with record highs or near record highs. So temperatures in the low 100s, high 90s, and many of these places are still without power. So when you look across the South, there are some 200,000 customers or more that still don't have power. They're working diligently to try and get it back up, but that really just makes the whole cleanup effort all the more difficult, Hallie. Blaine Alexander live for us there in New Orleans. Blaine, thank you. Bill Karens, let me bring you in now because, Bill, it is the heat. That is the, the big concern here, right, along with, of course, the rain and the potential for tornadoes that Blaine was talking about. Yeah, Hallie, you know, as a weather person trying to communicate heat, it's difficult because it's not visual. It's just numbers, and numbers can honestly get pretty boring. So I kind of like to tell people, like, there's different levels when we talk about the heat. So there's, like, it's a hot summer day. You know, maybe 100 degrees, not breaking record. That's down here. Then there's the hottest ever for that day, specifically. And then there's the hottest for that month, specifically. And then, finally, there's the all-time hottest temperature ever recorded in that area. And that's what we're dealing with today. We're up here. San Antonio. Angelo hit 114 degrees in the last hour before today and going back over 107 years the hottest they ever were was 111 degrees they have shattered their all-time hottest temperature that's 41,000 days of recording temperatures and today is by far the hottest Del Rio just tied their all-time record highs and Hallie let me show you what happens at 114 degrees in the sun in your car if you want to do this on your windshield yes you can bake cookies in your car that's just kind of a you know you see this sometimes in phoenix when it gets really hot too but yeah this may be a first for our friends in san angelo especially this early bill karens thank you very much appreciate it coming up here on the show what new york city fire officials say started a fire in an e-bike shop this morning that killed four people the concerns about that plus what one state's doing to try to stop thieves in stores and online this one's a little different we'll talk about it in just a sec Investigators think lithium ion batteries may be to blame for a fire that killed four people in Chinatown in New York City at an e-bike shop. The FDNY says it was an accident. Something happened on the first floor that apparently a battery caught fire. That then, look at this, spread to the apartments on the floor above. The fire chief really stressing how lethal these batteries can be when they ignite. Listen. This exact scenario where there are, is an e-bike store on the first floor and residences above and the volume of fire created by these lithium ion batteries is incredibly deadly. Police say in addition to the four people who were killed, two other people are in the hospital in critical condition tonight. Rahima Ellis is joining us now. And Rahima, New York City has tried to put in place safety standards, right, specifically when it comes to lithium ion batteries. Talk us through that. Yeah, they are. In fact, the mayor of New York City, uh, Mayor Adams, back in March, he put out something knowing the fact that you can hardly go anywhere in New York City without seeing these e-bikes. And so what he's saying, he wants to create a, a, a way of identifying the high-risk situations and the fire code violations and increase public uh, education and efforts about the damages of these lithium batteries. 
These batteries are um, on e-bikes, et cetera, which are like everywhere in cities like New York, like here in D.C., et cetera. Um, is it rare to have these kinds of fires? What is the concern about these batteries? Uh, there's a big concern about all of these batteries. And, in fact, uh, what you'll see is that the incidents linked to this, we've got another full screen we want to show you, that in, according to authorities, in 2003, so far, there have been over 100 fires and 13 deaths. That's according to the New York City Fire Department. But as you point out, this is not just a New York City problem. The Federal Consumer Product Safety Commission is planning a meeting next month to talk about these issues, because according to their website, they say over a two-year period, there have been more than 208 reports of battery fires. And that's led to, in 39 states. And that's led to something about at least 19 deaths. Hallie? Rahima Ellis, thank you very much for that reporting. Out West now, a first of its kind joint commitment today from both California and big stores to stop a multi million dollar, basically organized crime scheme to steal stuff. According to the state's attorney general, it's not just like your run of the mill shoplifting that officials said stores are worried about, it's bigger stuff. The state's attorney general telling our Miguel Almaguer this is a very visible problem in the state. We're seeing more and more of it, and we're seeing it go viral, you know, publicly, some of the incidents. So it's a, it's a challenge throughout the nation. You probably remember some of these incidents that had gone viral, right? L.A. and San Francisco, the top two cities, in addition to New York, top three, that are affected by this kind of thing. Um, L.A., Bay Area, California's Highway Patrol says it's opened nearly 1,300 investigations related to organized retail crime since 2019. Miguel Almaguer has more. Hey, Hallie, those violent and dangerous scenes often captured on surveillance video are chaotic, but they're also often the coordinated work of organized retail crime. From high-end luxury items to everyday products, what's stolen in those smashing grabs, which are carried out nationwide, often end up for resale on well-known marketplaces. Now Rob Bonta, California's attorney general, is announcing a new partnership between major retailers and distributors like Amazon, Meta, and eBay to better track and identify stolen products to help prosecutors with evidence and ultimately prevent the sale of stolen goods. Merchants lost nearly $100 billion last year to organize retail crime. Here's what the state AG told me earlier today. By uh, opening up uh, the black box to see what's inside and being able to grab information and pin down who's doing what, uh, where do they get the items, where are they reselling it, uh, we can get, uh, you know, hold accountable those who are involved. Striking back against those smash and grabs and organized retail crime is going to be a tough task, but in the end, it should help consumers who pay a premium for items marked up after retailers lose money on stolen goods. Hallie? Our thanks to Miguel Almaguer for that reporting. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the head of Alibaba, that Chinese huge tech company, is stepping down not long after the company announced its biggest restructuring ever. A co-founder will step in as CEO, and Joe Tsai will be the new chairman. He helped found the company back in 1999. He also owns the Brooklyn Nets. It's Alibaba's second big leadership change since co-founder Jack Ma stepped away in 2019. Number two, one of former President Trump's allies, John Eastman, could lose his law license over his support of the push to overturn the legitimate 2020 election. He's got hearings starting today in California, facing 11 charges related to allegations he tried to push this conspiracy theory to help Donald Trump overturn the election. Prosecutors say he also lied about election interference. Number three, Gannett, the publisher of USA Today and some other newspapers, just sued Google for its ad practices saying that Google essentially dominates online ads, so that makes it hard for pro uh, publishers to turn a profit. It's the latest in a bunch of lawsuits against Google for alleged anti-competitive behavior. Number four, the New York Police Department says dozens of LGBTQ plus pride flags were vandalized over the weekend at Stonewall in New York City. The third time that this has happened during this year's Pride Month. No word yet on possible subject, suspect rather, but police are looking into it. The monument sits across the street from the Stonewall Inn, the site of a riot in 1969, which helped spark the LGBTQ plus rights movement. Number five, Morgan Wallen's son was hospitalized after getting bit in the face by a family dog. The singer's ex-wife posted on Instagram that her son had to get stitches, but that he's doing okay now. She said she's not gonna have the dog put down, but instead he'll go to live with a new family. 
When we come back, French investigators raiding the headquarters of the Paris Olympics today will explain why, spoiler, corruption, and what it means for the games coming up. There's one part of Florida under quarantine today because of a species you may not expect. We're going to explain in just a minute with the local. But first, the executive director of the Olympics tonight says there's every reason to be confident about 2024, even though the police raided the Olympic headquarters in Paris. Yeah, searches carried out as part of two open corruption investigations of the 2024 Games. French prosecutors say they're looking at possible conflicts of interest, embezzlement, maybe favoritism connected to the contracts the Olympics is handing out. Officials are also searching the headquarters of several private companies who have gotten some of those contracts. A spokesperson for the Games confirmed this police investigation, telling NBC News Paris 2024 is cooperating fully with the investigators to facilitate things. Keir Simmons is joining us now. It sounds sort of bizarre that the headquarters of the, of the Paris Olympics is getting searched by police here. What, what kind of stuff are we talking about? Do we think yeah. it'll have any effect on the games itself? Yeah, and it's so disappointing, isn't it, Ali? Because uh, we were so excited years, years ago, uh, the first game since COVID yeah. in Paris of all places, uh, blue skies, summer games, and now this, this police raid, which, you know, honestly, just seemed to come out of nowhere. It looks like some folks knew about it. One French newspaper today talking about the fact that there had been this investigation, some of which people weren't didn't really know about, or maybe it just wasn't on your radar. Let's just take a look at that. So in 2017, there's this suspected embezzlement of public funds and an allegation of favoritism, and then a concerns over an unspecified contract. They, they're forward to 2022, um, and there's talk of a suspected conflict of interest of favoritism uh, involving several contracts uh, for Olympic Olympic uh, facilities. So you know we've known that there's been unhappiness. Uh, there has even been a, a high level recent resignation just, just a month ago uh, with the uh, Olympic Organising Committee for Paris uh, 2024. Uh, but now this has burst out into the open, uh, Ali, with these uh, police raids. Uh, now, clearly, it's still an investigation. That's there right. are, there are, there's no charges at this stage. We, we don't know exactly right. where this will land. And there is always controversy for it before an Olympics, but <laughs> here we are again. There's controversy before an Olympics. Well, you talk about the controversy before the Olympics. This is the third straight summer games to have a corruption investigation. You talk about, and I think rightly, Keir, it's an investigation. We don't know the outcome of the investigation yet. We right. don't want to prejudge, prejudge that. At what point does there become a reputational issue, right? Just even the fact that these investigations are happening. Uh, yeah, good question. And at what point does this start to become a problem for the reputation of uh, President uh, Macron, who yeah. already isn't exactly loved by the French people? I mean, he's in his, sec he's in his second term. Uh, very few French presidents are loved by the French people, especially in their, in their second term. Uh, but, you know, he has seen these games as crucial to his career, if you like. They're going to be happening towards the twilight of his uh, presidential uh, run. Uh, and he was determined to ensure that corruption uh, was not part of, of these, these games the way they were in the past. Let's just look at, take a look at that. I mean, you remember uh, back in Rio in 2016, there were those vote-buying allegations. Uh, and then uh, with Tokyo 2020, which, of course, didn't happen in 2020, 2021 because of uh, COVID, uh, there was a corruption investigation. A, an official was actually arrested by the police there. Uh, so th there has been this history, particularly, and I mentioned Rio, particularly around this question of whether everything is fair in terms of the bidding for a games. Uh, that doesn't appear to be what's being alleged here. It's more this time, yeah. it seems, to do with what happens when the games are being being uh, put together, you know, where the contracts go. That's right. Uh, but it's, it's not great, is it? It's not a great way to, 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 to celebrate, you know, 12 months to go. I, I got to tell you, Kira, I don't know. I know you just were part of that celebration. Um, we're going to be watching this one, of course, as the games get closer. Kira Simmons, live for us from overseas. Thank you, Kira. Appreciate it. That's right. Coming up, an important group of health experts for the first time ever says all of us, anybody under the age of 65, needs to get screened for anxiety. 
what it looks like and who the group says should be especially paid attention to coming up after the break. Catholics around the world are telling the Vatican to welcome women in decision-making roles and also calling for the, I'm quoting here, radical inclusion of the LGBTQ plus community. This is coming from an unprecedented survey today of Catholics, which is gonna be the foundation of a big meeting for the church in October. That's when leaders are set to go over some of the challenges that the church is facing. The document's also flagging concerns that the church's sexual abuse scandals has had on its credibility among worshipers. NBC News Vatican analyst Christopher White joins us now. Chris, thank you for being with us live from Rome. Uh, the, the view, I'm sure, is lovely out one of your windows in your, in your house there overseas. Um, help us understand this, because the idea of the Catholic Church and the gay community, there's a lot here, and there was obviously a lot in this survey about that, right? That's right. I mean, th this document that came out today is the result of a three-year listening process that's taken place in every continent around the globe. And one of the major themes that has come back time and time again is saying, if the Catholic Church wants to have a relationship in the modern world, it has to reckon uh, with its relationship with the gay community and also with the role of women. So it's putting all this on the table for a big discussion at the Vatican for a month-long meeting in October. Is I wonder if this stat that I'm about to talk about with you plays into that, right? This recent Gallup polling that shows that overall church membership in the United States is down, but especially for the Catholic Church. It's gone down something like 18% in about the last two decades here. Is this in some ways about Catholic leaders looking to bring people back into the fold? Yeah, I mean, if you read the document, it's 60 pages. It's an extensive document that addresses a ton of issues, not just about women and LGBTQ issues, but, you know, those are the issues that surface time and time again. And the, the, the language that it uses is that, you know, the church in the modern world today, and it talks about an urgency for radical inclusion. And these are the hot button issues that we all hear about, uh, and they've made their way to the, to the Pope's desk. Uh, and so the Pope is going to convene this big meeting, and we'll see what comes out of it. The Catholic Church, of course, is reluctant to change. It's a, an archaic institution. But what mm, we've seen over the right. last 10 years is the Pope trying to bring the Church into the modern world and being unafraid to answer and address questions that a lot of Catholics in everyday life uh, have. Chris White, thank you very much. Live for us from Rome. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, an update for you on this moment we showed you. BB Rexa, look at this. She got hit by a phone performing in New York. She drops to her knees. Well, a criminal complaint says the guy accused of doing it thought it would be funny. He was let go with no bail after, uh, excuse me, he, he was arrested on harassment and assault charges. His lawyer says he pleaded not guilty, telling NBC the man just wanted to have BB Rex to take pictures with his phone and then give it back, that he never meant to hurt her. Out of our Western Bureau, imagine calling for help and AI picks up. That's what's happening in Portland. They're testing a system there this week where an AI system will answer calls that are not emergencies and then either give info directly or else transfer the call. One official says the system can even text people information. If this goes well, they could use it for stuff like 311, basically to help distribute call volume. And out of our Southern Bureau, part of one Florida county is under quarantine because of this giant African land snails. Basically, people cannot move them or a bunch of other things like plants or dirt while officials try to get rid of the snails. They're super invasive. This is a problem. They can cause a lot of damage. They eat paint and stucco. They carry a parasite that can cause problems for people. So everybody's like, get those snails out of there. So for the first time ever, a public health panel recommends that all of us, every adult under the age of 65, get screened on the reg for anxiety and depression, even if you don't have symptoms. This is a big deal, right? What this means is routine mental health screening for everybody, not at a therapist's office, but at your regular doctor's office. This task force recommends specifically screening pregnant and postpartum women, saying they are different populations, so referrals on that. The new guidance comes as emotional stress has really gone up lately. More and more demands on how few counselors and therapists there are ready and available to sort of take people on as new clients. If you've tried to get a therapist recently, you know that's not super easy. Dr. John Torres is joining us now. There's a lot that's interesting here, Dr. John, starting with 
This is a screening that will be done at your regular doctor's office. Number one, that assumes you go for your regular physical every year. And number two, that assumes that your doctor is not slammed um, and unable to spend more than a couple of minutes with you. That's been a big critique from people who are face to face with their doctors who feel like their doctors may not be able to give them that time. And Hallie, you're exactly correct. I think there's going to be a big bottleneck at the beginning here now that they've released these guidelines of people trying to get the screening test, doctors trying to do the screening test, and eventually this filtering down to where there's a system set up to do this. But essentially what they're saying is, what you talked about just a second ago, is that there aren't that many therapists out there enough to fill the need. So they're saying, okay, let's bring this to the primary care office because in addition to the other things we look for when they're in there, you know, cholesterol, blood pressure, you know, cancer screening type situations, this anxiety screening is very important. And it's piggybacking on a depression screening that they set out guidelines for a few years ago. And what they're saying is, you just need to ask simple questions. And we have a full screen here of some of the questions they'll be looking to ask. And this could be as simple as doing it right before you get into the office as you're filling out that paperwork. Have you been easily annoyed or irritated? Are you bothered by this uncontrollable worry? Have you felt restless and it was hard to sit still? These simple questions. And the important thing to remember is this is not a diagnosis. This is a screening test. If you answer yes to these, then they can look deeper into this issue and see if this is something they need to either treat or refer you to. But the main idea here is to try and capture as many people here as possible because right. a lot are falling through the cracks right now, Hallie. There's also that specific attention paid to women who are pregnant or women who have just had babies here, right? Exactly. And they're ones who tend to be at a higher risk for anxiety during that, especially during that postpartum period and that pregnancy period. And so they're saying pay extra attention to them as well and make sure they get the screening tests. You know, they want adults 64 and under to get it, but they're emphasizing this population as well to make sure that we don't miss them. What separates medically diagnosable anxiety, Dr. John, from just having a stressed out life? Or is it the same thing? And you know, we all have stress. We all have stress in our life, and it depends on how you handle it that pushes it to that level of anxiety, because everybody handles it differently, and there's different levels of stress for everybody. And so, what differentiates it is how much it's affecting your life, and that's what those questions are trying to get to: Is this Got affecting it. you and affecting your life, or are you able to handle the amount of stress and anxiety you have in your life right now? And if the answer is no, I'm not able to handle that. Let's get you that help you need in order to be able to handle that, because that's something we all should be able to do. That's the kind and help we should be able to get, and that's what they're aiming for here, Hallie. And keeping in mind this is guidance, not mandatory, how realistic is it that this is going to be picked up by doctors around the country? And I think this is very realistic because if you look at all the guidelines, you know, looking at blood pressure treatment, looking at cancer screenings, looking at the different guidelines for mammograms that are out there, these are guidelines. They're not mandated, but yet physicians do them on a regular basis. Insurance companies cover this as well now that the USPSTF has decided they're going to put it in their guidelines. And so that certainly helps along the way. And like I mentioned, there'll be a little bit of bottleneck for the next couple of years as this all gets ironed out. But once it gets to the point where it is on a, happening on a regular basis, you'll see this along with the other screening tests that go on at your doctor's office. Dr. John Torres, thank you so much. Still to come here on the show. You've maybe seen stuff about RFK Jr. on your timelines. You might know he's running for president. But if you want to know what he's really about, stick around because our backstory goes behind the scenes with one of our reporters who went on a hike with him. Ten years in the making. What an RFK White House would look like next. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. Tonight, we're talking Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Democratic candidate for president out in New Hampshire tonight. He's set to talk about what his foreign policy platform would look like. And if you recognize his name, it might be because you know him as a member of the Kennedy family, one of the country's most famous political families. His uncle, President John F. Kennedy, his father, a U.S. Attorney General and New York Senator. RFK Jr. is also an environmental lawyer who helped lead the push to clean up the Hudson and New York City watershed. But today, he's also known as a vaccine skeptic, a leader in the anti-vax movement. And you can see where he is in the polls. Joe Biden, obviously, with that very healthy 70 percent lead, RFK right there at 17 percent, with some interest from voters on both the right and left, which is why we're taking a look at what an RFK Jr. administration could look like, straight from the candidate himself, in a new interview with NBC's own Brandy Zadrosny. Here's what he would do, right? He would make childhood vaccines go through basically constant safety studies. 
even bigger clinical trials. He would gut agencies like the FDA, NIH, CDC. He would ask the Justice Department to investigate the editors of medical journals for, quote, lying to the public. Brandy is joining us now. Um, Brandy, thank you so much for being here. This segment is all about kind of behind the scenes and how this, how this piece comes together. You took a hike with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. out in California. We just showed some of the pictures there. You have written that it was like a decade in the making. You've asked for interviews with him before. He has turned you down. There are some complaints that maybe from, I think, people on the left that he gets too much airtime here. He is a presidential candidate. Can you talk through your thought process here, making the request for the interview, why you felt it was important to tell this story here? Yeah, thanks for having me, Holly. I love this segment. Um, so we, uh, I first reached out to, to RFK, as I've done many times before, and he has um, said no many times before. But I reached out to him because I was watching his campaign and listening to his kickoff speech, and I was looking at his website, and suddenly I didn't see the word vaccines anywhere. And that's like basically the president of Ford Motor Company coming out and not saying the word car. So it was like, what, what's happening here? What's going on? And it seemed to me that he was trying to make himself more palatable, that this was a strategic move because Democrats don't, um, Democrats do really love vaccines generally. Polling among Democrats shows that they think vaccines are safe and effective. So it's kind of hard to run for president um, of, you know, in the Democratic ticket when you um, don't align with your party in that way. So he's not saying it as much. So I reached out and I was really surprised that he said yes. And um, even in a sort of um, strange setting, I said, yes, I'll be on the hike. So, you know, I went and I think I hear that a lot, right? Like we shouldn't give him attention. We shouldn't platform him. That's crazy. You know, we've passed the point where it's an option to ignore this man. You know, I think we passed it years ago because whether you like it or not, you know, Kennedy is here and people are listening to him. He was just on Joe Rogan's podcast last week where it reached millions of people. He was trending all weekend long. Right. And so, you know, I, our job isn't to gatekeep as as journalists. You know, I think everybody yeah. should go listen to that Joe Rogan show, actually. Our job is to explain and add context and, you know, to explain the stakes and ask tough questions that make those stakes really clear. And we've seen what the anti-vaccine movement can do. Millions of lives lost to COVID, um, eradicated diseases like polio and measles coming back. So I, I feel like we I feel like we ignore him at our own peril. You know, I was struck by so many details from your stories, Brandy, but one of them that a university researcher uh, texted you, hashtag gamma, give America measles again, when you asked about what an RFK presidency or candidacy would look like here because of sort of where he is in the vaccine skeptic movement. You talk about, you know, holding truth to power in some ways, trying to combat misinformation. You did that a little bit in this hike. I mean, you talk about this in this hike slash interview, going back and forth with him about what's true, what's not, about COVID and vaccines and everything else. And at one point you write that the conversation felt unsettling to you. Explain that. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think that I talk to a lot of conspiracy theorists, right? And, you know, internet adult people, and I consider um, Kennedy Jr. to be uh, both of those things. But, you know, what's unsettling about it is, again, I've covered this man for a decade. And when you go to these anti-vaccine marches, you see hundreds and thousands of people who are just enamored with him, right? They believe whatever he says, um, especially women who for decades in the anti-vaccine movement have just like hung on his every word and taken everything that he said as like gospel. You know, he's done a lot of real harm. So just being, I've never met him before. So, uh, you know, being side by side with him and asking him these questions, you know, what I what sort of struck me is that he really believes all of these things. There's a delusion there. And, um, you know, I, I think that, that that's a little dangerous. You know, I let myself for a second imagine what he would do as president, you know, and just like you said, he'd gut those agencies. He would not prioritize vaccines for the next pandemic, which will happen. He'll investigate scientists and medical journals. You know, the odds are low that he's going to win, but the stakes are really high. And I could really feel that on the mountain. Brandy Zadrozny, thank you so much for sort of pulling back the curtain and giving us a sense of your thought process as you went about this profile. Folks can read it on NBCNews.com. Brandy, thank you as always. Appreciate it. That does it for us for this hour. More coverage picks up right now. Coming on the air with that extraordinary and desperate race against the clock to save five people on board that missing sub somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. 
time and air running out as we're just now hearing the Navy is sending help. We'll tell you what else we're learning and some of the details about what life might be like inside that thing. Also tonight, did Hunter Biden get a sweetheart deal? Republicans are accusing the Department of Justice of doing just that. His lawyer telling our team that's not true. President Biden in the last little bit weighing in. What we're learning tonight about that plea agreement for the president's son. We'll also take you live to New Orleans, a city that is bracing for some really bad weather tonight with a tropical storm bearing down on the south and a heat wave ripping through Texas. Plus, the New York Fire Commissioner blaming lithium-ion batteries for a fire that ended in the deaths of four people. We'll tell you how the city's trying to take a harder line stance on safety. Plus, police in Paris raiding the city's Olympic headquarters just a year out from the Summer Games. Why claims of corruption are more common than you may think. That's later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight we are learning the five people inside that missing sub trying to tour the Titanic wreckage have only less than 40 hours of oxygen left, maybe a day and a half worth of oxygen left, and what is now becoming this race to try to find this thing in an incredibly harsh environment that's more like outer space than planet Earth. We're just in the last couple of minutes finding out the Navy is sending some of its equipment and some of its personnel to help. And we've also found out the names of all five people on this sub, this submersible. They're Stockton Rush. He's the CEO of the private company that runs this trip called Ocean Gate. He was the pilot. There's French diver Paul Henry Narjolet. There's Shazada Dawood, a businessman from Pakistan, and his son, Suleiman. There's Hamish Harding, a British billionaire and explorer. They descended to check out the Titanic wreckage in this tube, basically, super tight seating. Look at this. This is how Ocean Gate says passengers typically sit. You can see how cramped it is. It's because the sub's pretty tiny. It's just a few feet longer than a minivan, about 22 feet in all. You can see some of this animation here from Ocean Gate. That's the sub. That's the Titanic wreckage. It can get down to 13,000 feet underwater. For context, the best Navy sub can only get down to about 2,000 feet. Inside the sub, you saw the seating. There's a little bathroom. It's separated by a curtain. And in all, they bring down about four days' worth of emergency oxygen. That's what's reserved at the start. Again, that's down to an estimated maybe day and a half at this point. Rescuers are essentially looking for a needle in a pitch black haystack. It's so dark, you can barely see your hand in front of your face. There is unbelievable water pressure from how deep this is. That's why you have some rescuers dropping sonar buoys. They're trying to listen for the sub, which could be two miles under the surface of the ocean. Just in case it has surfaced, let's say, the Canadian Coast Guard is flying planes like these to see if they can spot it. The Air Force is sending C-17s to help move equipment for the rescue. It's not like the sub itself is super duper bells and whistles. Look at this, see that little button? Looks like an elevator button. CBS's David Pogue was on a submersible like this with the CEO of this company. That's the controller for the sub. It's basically like a game controller, like an Xbox controller kind of thing. In a podcast interview, Stockton talked with Pogue about his greatest fear. Listen. Once we're down there, what are the things to worry about? So what I worry about most are things that will stop me from being able to get to the surface. Overhangs, uh, fishnets, entanglement hazards, and that's just a technique, you know, piloting technique. You, it's pretty clear. If it's an overhang, don't go under it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if uh, if there's a net, don't go near it. So um, you can you can avoid those if you're just slow and steady. Tom Costello is joining us now live from Boston. Tom, you were there as the Coast Guard is updating people again today about this search. Tell us more. Yeah, uh, they are searching an area the size of Connecticut. It is massive. It's in a very remote stretch of the North Atlantic, as you know, 900 miles off the coast of Massachusetts. It's a, it's a coordinated effort between the U.S. Coast Guard and the Canadian Coast Guard. It's based, the command center is here in Boston right behind me, but the distance is massive. So already, as you said, we've had Canadian and American Coast Guard planes, C-130s, really kind of working a grid search. And what they're looking for is any sign of the submersible on the water that the hope is that it would have already floated to the surface and maybe it's on the water. So far, they haven't seen anything. They've dropped those sonar buoys that you mentioned, listening for anything underwater. So far, they haven't heard anything at all. In the meantime, those C-17s rushing salvage equipment to Newfoundland because they might need that salvage equipment to lift up this sub if they can find it. There is no way that you could put a diver at that 
depth. You talked about how deep it is, two and a half miles down. That's about 400 times the pressure that you and I have here on, on the sea level. It would crush a diver, and it can crush many subs that go down there. As you mentioned, even a U.S. Navy sub only goes two to 3,000 feet below the surface. So the stakes are very high, and only if and when they can hopefully find the sub, then they got to figure out how do we possibly bring it up. By the way, there are the hatch to open it, you can't open it from the inside, you can only open it from the outside, unscrewing bolts. So there are great security, safety concerns really about this mini sub. We talked about the people on board. We know that the CEO is essentially the pilot at this point. Um, we, we know that one yeah. of the people on board, that French Navy diver, has been to this wreck site something like 35 times, dozens of times, Tom. So these are all experienced individuals for this type of adventure, if you will. And for the, in the case of, for example, Hamish Harding, who's the billionaire from, from the UK, he's been diving in the Mariana Trench. He's actually been on a Jeff Bezos rocket into space. But this, the overriding question here is, okay, if they can find this vessel, can they possibly lift it up? So I asked that question of the US Coast Guard today. If your submersibles can find this sub, is there any way to retrieve it and save the people on board? We have a group of, of uh, our nation's best experts in the Unified Command, and if we get to that point, uh, those experts will be looking at what the next course of action is. So in other words, at least when I talked to him a short time ago, they don't really have a plan yet, but they are rushing that salvage equipment to Newfoundland. But then, Hallie, they've got to get it from Newfoundland out to the site. That could right. take a day, two, three days to get out there on, on a ship, and they may not have that much time. The clock is ticking. The backdrop here, too, Tom, some raising safety questions now. We're just learning about a lawsuit that a pilot filed against Ocean Gate. He says he was fired for warning that the sub was not safe for deep dives. What else can you tell us? Yeah. So that was in 2018, and he came forward and he said he wasn't sure that the hull itself, the titanium and carbon fiber hull, could withstand those depths and that it wasn't tested for the depths that it was operating out at. Uh, they settled that lawsuit out of court. Separately, the New York Times is reporting that several dozen individuals who are experts in the field of submersibles raised a concern several years ago that, in fact, this sub wasn't safe and that it wasn't certified and that it hadn't been tested properly. So all of that is the backdrop as this urgent search is on the way for the sub. And as you mentioned, you know, we are well under 40 hours of air That's left right. because it left at 8 a.m. on Sunday. So now we're at about a day and a half of air left inside that sub if they're alive. And we certainly hope they are. Tom Costello live for us in Boston, uh, tracking every movement on this. Tom, thank you so much. Let's bring it back here to Washington, where in just about the last hour and 90 minutes, we've heard from President Biden for the first time on camera about a federal plea deal for his son, Hunter, that could let Hunter Biden avoid prison time. Listen. I'm very proud of my son. OK, so quick, maybe a little tough to hear. That's a reporter shouting a question about Hunter Biden, the president responding, I'm very proud of my son. Republicans are not pleased at all with this plea deal. Former President Trump, who, of course, himself is facing 37 federal counts related to that classified documents investigation, calls this a traffic ticket and a scam, he says, with the DOJ. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy echoing that. If you were the president's leading political opponent, the DOJ tries to literally put you in jail and give you prison time. If you are the president's son, you get a sweetheart deal. McCarthy calling that a sweetheart deal. Late today, MSNBC's Katie Turr asking Hunter Biden's attorney exactly that question. Does he think it's a sweetheart deal? I've heard Speaker McCarthy say a lot of stuff I don't agree with. There was no basis for what he said, and he's not right. Court documents just revealed today show that Hunter Biden is expected to plead guilty to two federal misdemeanors for failing to pay something like $100,000 in taxes in 2017 and 2018. Prosecutors may also dismiss a separate gun charge if Hunter Biden goes through a pretrial diversion program. Two sources say that the Trump-appointed federal attorney overseeing this case will probably recommend probation for the tax violations. We'll get into the politics of it all with Saha Kapoor in just a minute, but I want to start with Ken Delanian in Wilmington, Delaware. Ken, put it into plain English for us here. What is Hunter Biden acknowledging he did wrong in this deal? 
He's acknowledging he committed crimes by willfully failing to pay taxes in 2017 and 2018. And, you know, stepping back, look, this is a five-year investigation by a Donald Trump-appointed U.S. attorney and a group of independent FBI agents, IRS agents, even counterintelligence agents. And they looked very closely, not only at these tax issues, we're told, but other aspects of Hunter Biden's business dealings, his financial relationships with Ukrainian and Chinese entities. And these are the charges that resulted. And we don't know what other charges were possible, whether other felonies were considered, how these negotiations played out. So it's really hard on the outside to grade whether this is a tough deal, a lenient deal. What we mm. do know is that the Justice Department is satisfied with it. Hunter Biden's lawyers are satisfied with it. And congressional Republicans, of course, are not, Alan. There's also that line that, that you have pointed out that it says um, in this thing that, there, that the investigation is ongoing, essentially. And I'm paraphrasing here. We know that Hunter Biden's attorney says they don't believe that to be the case. What's our reporting on that? Well, look, this, as, as I said, this investigation involved a detailed scrub of Hunter Biden's financial affairs. And these are the charges that prosecutors chose to bring. Now, that line suggests that there are other related matters that may still be under investigation. But Hunter Biden's lawyers are saying, as far as he's concerned, this is it. And they're saying they would not have cut this deal, essentially, if they thought that their client was at risk of further charges. So it appears that okay. as far as Hunter personally is concerned, this thing is done. But the investigation itself may be looking into other areas. Ken Delaney, live for us in Wilmington. Ken, thank you. Let me go to Sahil Kapoor, who's live for us on Capitol Hill. Let's pick up on the politics of it. And let me pull up how some 2024 Republicans, Republicans running for president next year, are talking about this, describing it as a sweetheart deal. You see it there, slap on the wrist, a joke, uh, a scam. We need answers. Asa Hutchinson, I'll note on the right side of your screen, calling it an important step. He is somebody who has often bucked the political orthodoxy of his party. Talk us through what you're seeing and hearing from your vantage point and how this relates to the investigations that Republicans have been leading into the Biden family. Right. Well, Hallie, Republicans came into control of the House earlier this year, and one of their singular targets for investigation was Hunter Biden. And trying to find a link there between anything the president might have done to further um, some of his business dealings, which we know now are with some uh, fairly shady individuals. Hunter Biden is now admitting in, as part of this plea deal that he committed some crimes. But Republicans on Capitol Hill are not satisfied with this. They're not going to be satisfied with this. We should expect their investigations to continue and for them to continue to look for links between anything uh, President Biden might have done uh, to further some of his son's activities, which they don't have evidence for quite yet. Uh, one key person to watch here is James Comer, the Oversight Committee chair. Let's put up his statement on this. He says, quote, these charges against Hunter Biden uh, and sweetheart plea deal have no impact on the Oversight Committee's investigation. We will not rest until the full extent of President Biden's involvement in the family schemes are revealed. Speaker McCarthy, as you as you just played earlier, separately said that now the investigation by the DO, now that the investigation by the DOJ is closing, that the Justice Department will be obligated to provide the House more information. That gives you a sense of where Republicans are likely to be headed. President Biden in the past has said his son is innocent. Republicans, it seems, want this to be an issue on the campaign trail, and the polling would indicate why, right? That's absolutely right. They do want him to be an issue on the campaign trail. He has been a fairly effective rallying cry for, you know, a lot of Republicans to stir up their base, make this connection between the president and, you know, create the impression that uh, the president is doing something wrong by, by virtue of who his son is. Let's show some poll numbers that speak to this a little bit from a, a Harvard-Harris poll recently. Not good for Hunter Biden, but especially bad, as you can see, among Republicans on the column on the right. Uh, this is one. Let's go to the the uh, next graphic on this that asks voters, was Hunter Biden involved in illegal influence peddling and tax uh, evasion? Overall, most Americans think yes. Among Republicans, it's lopsided. And finally, um, the question was asked, has the Justice Department investigation into Hunter Biden been fair? Uh, this one's a little bit mixed. Fair, 36 percent say fair, 26 percent unfair, and 38 percent. That's a plurality unsure. As you can see, the numbers are quite different on the Republican side, Hallie. Now, Democrats also, uh, you know, might have to address some of this, given the prominence of this investigation in the news cycle. I spoke to one Democratic senator, Jackie Rosen of Nevada, who is up in 2024, and she said this, quote, Hunter Biden is not on the ballot. This is a matter for the Justice Department. Mm. They've been investigating this for years. These are the charges they came forward with, and I trust the DOJ to have a fair and equitable process, unquote. So that's, that gives you a flavor of how Democrats are going to be treating this going forward. This is the Justice 
Justice Department matter. Uh, and, you know, they, they are treating everyone fairly, and Democrats say this is evidence of the Justice Department's independence, that they busted a sitting president's son, uh, which doesn't happen every day. Sahil Kapoor, live for us on The Hill. Thank you. Former Special Counsel John Durham, also on The Hill, testifying to a couple of House committees led by Republicans about his report on the so-called uh, origins of the investigation investigation, the investigation into the investigation, if you will, the way that the inquiry into former President Trump and his 26th campaign's alleged ties to Russia came about. Right now, he's been speaking with the House Intelligence Committee behind closed doors. He'll do that all over again tomorrow in front of the House Judiciary Committee. Remember, Durham's report criticized the FBI quite a bit for how it investigated the Trump campaign, but did not find any evidence of criminal activity in the Bureau. Mr. Trump has claimed that, with all of it fitting into these broader GOP claims of a two-tiered justice system. More on that as we get it. We want to get you some developing news now, though, out of Arkansas, where a federal judge has now struck down the state's ban on gender-affirming care for minors. We just got the ruling. You see it here. Remember, Arkansas was the first state to stop doctors from giving these treatments to transgender kids. They overrode a veto from the then governor and now Republican presidential candidate Asa Hutchinson back in 2021. The judge says the ban violates the First and Fourteenth Amendment rights for trans kids in the state. Vaughn Hilliard is joining us now. Okay, so Vaughn, let me step back. Let me put this into context. Right. The reason why this decision matters and the reason why this was so closely watched is because this is the sort of first decision to come down on a wave of um, laws that have been passed in mostly conservative states that restrict care for trans kids. Now you've got a federal judge basically saying, you cannot do this. Walk us through the implications. Right. The biggest implication, Hallie, is the fact that trans youth and their families around the country have been awaiting this ruling and watched it come down after more than two years of it playing out in the court system. As you said, Arkansas was the first state legislator to enact this into law back in 2021. I was talking to a trans youth in nearby Tennessee this spring. She told me that she was watching when Arkansas overrode Asa Hutchinson's veto at the time. Asa Hutchinson, a Republican, said that they went too far because because the law enacted in Arkansas, it banned not only puberty blockers and other hormone treatment, but also surgery for trans youth. And what you have seen play out is 19 other states since pass similar types of restrictions here. And what you have now is a federal judge uh, make a ruling that permanently bans the state from enacting these sorts of restrictions. Now, if you see in the judge's ruling, uh, Judge James Moody Jr. writes, quote, rather than protecting children or safeguarding medical ethics, the evidence showed that the prohibited medical care improves the mental health and well-being of patients, and that by prohibiting it, the state undermined the interests it claims to be advancing. The governor, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, said that the state attorney general will be appealing to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, Hallie. Vaughn, with respect to your position as a political reporter and not a legal analyst, right. can you help us understand at all, is there something to be drawn from this as we look at the bigger picture of this GOP push to ban gender-affirming care for trans kids? In other words, um, can, can this ruling be extrapolated to suggest that perhaps there will be other legal challenges for some of these other laws in other states? Right. This ruling applies only to Arkansas. Other judges have uh, put uh, temporary holds on legislature's laws. But Republicans nationally, including Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis, have thrusted trans-affirming care for minors uh, front and center of the presidential campaign here. It usually ignites the largest receptions at Republicans. Republican rallies here, and they make the case that they are trying to protect children uh, under the age of 18 from making life-altering decisions. Now, to be clear, the regret rate is extremely, extremely low among trans mm -hmm. youth as they grow older here. But when you're talking about the potential repercussions politically, you know, there's talks about fe bans fed at, the, at the federal level. That is what Donald Trump has suggested, that if he were to get into the White House again, he'd press. Of course, that is where you come to a head between what potentially uh, a, a Congress, a Republican and Congress would pass with what the courts are now ruling. This is just the beginning of what we could expect to be a long, drawn-out legal battle here, Hallie. Vaughn Hilliard, thank you so much for bringing us some of this developing news just into us tonight here at News Now. Let's take it down south where there is the potential for really bad storms and really awful heat with millions of people looking at the possibility of strong wind, big hail, maybe some tornadoes. Right now, it's New Orleans getting ready to get slammed. In Texas, they're staying dry for now, but look at this, so hot. It is so hot, 30 million people have a heat index of at least 105. That's like mid-July type stuff. It doesn't usually happen this hot this early in mid-June. Already, a lot of places in, south, uh, in the south, you see it here, they're just 
trying to clean up after a whole bunch of bad weather. Tornadoes ripped through parts of Mississippi. You have tens of thousands of people who still do not have power there. NBC meteorologist Bill Cairns will join us in a minute, but I want to start on the ground in New Orleans with Blaine Alexander. Blaine, you have been throughout the region. You were in Mississippi, which saw a lot of destruction from those storms, as we just showed. Now you're in New Orleans. They are getting ready for really bad weather there. The concern is potential flooding, right? Well, yeah, Hallie, and the good news is, is that what we're expecting to see here in New Orleans is not going to be nearly as bad as what we saw throughout parts of Mississippi and Texas. We'll get to that in a second. But there is certainly still some concern here, and you nailed it. We're talking about rain. You know, we are right now under a moderate flood watch for the next couple of hours. And so the concern is that we could see heavy downpour, possible flash flooding across the area. And then the other things that come with thunderstorms. So we're talking about possibly one-inch hail. We're talking about lightning strikes, strong gusty winds up to 60 miles per hour and then of course the possibility of isolated tornadoes so that's what the people here in the region or in this area are watching for but the good news is we're not expecting to see the type of outbreaks that we saw earlier this week now that really is something that caused a lot of devastation in parts of mississippi and parts of texas we just came from lewin mississippi we started the day there actually and that place was parts of that area we're definitely devastated. We're talking about homes that were unrecognizable. We're talking about uh, tractor trailers that were picked up, carried down the street, and, and landed uh, on their side. So we're talking about really a strong winds already there. An EF3 tornado has been confirmed in that area, Hallie. So that's one uh, kind of side of the coin. The other one, as you mentioned, though, heat. That's certainly something mm. that a lot of people are concerned about. When you talk about folks across the South, there are still several hundred thousand people, more than 200,000 people or so, that are still working on getting their power back on. So when you combine the fact that some of those areas are the places that have seen this severe weather, we're talking about people trying to clean up, no power, no air. It certainly compounds the situation for so many people, Hallie. Blaine Alexander live for us there in New Orleans. Blaine, thank you so much for that. Let me get to Bill Karens now. And Bill, it's kind of a heat dome, right? I mean, the heat is the real concern here. I know that it. Um, people are like, well, it's getting to be summer. It's getting to be hot. Not like this. Uh, in Dallas right now, Hallie, if you stepped out in the shade, it hasn't felt this hot in 43 years. It just hit 117 wow. in the Dallas area. So everyone's like, Dallas is always hot. Yes, they are hot all summer, but this is hotter than any time the heat index going back 43 years. That's something. Wow. So we mentioned the 32 million. So here it is, Dallas right now feeling like 117. Corpus Christi still feels like 119. Every single day, Corpus Christi has been feeling like about 120. Uh, San Angelo, it's interesting. The temperature's 109, more of a dry heat there. In San Angelo, you were 100. 114 degrees. You broke your all-time record high temperature, but it's not quite as humid as it is, say, in Dallas or Corpus Christi. That's why the heat index isn't quite as high. Dallas, you get a little bit of a break as the temperatures drop a little bit Thursday, Friday, but I hate to say it, they're going to go right back up after this into the weekend and next week. It stays just as hot in many areas. Look at Laredo, 113 tomorrow, 109, 108. And you mentioned that heat dome. Here's the forecast for the last week of June as we go throughout the end of the month. This heat dome sits right over the same region. So they may get a little bit of a break over the next couple of days, and then it's just going to come right back. It's interesting. We were showing that shot with Blaine, and it's not that hot because the thunderstorms have been diving all around New Orleans, but not where she is. I'm glad her and her crew is dry and yeah. all this lightning is away from her. But we do have really nasty thunderstorms just to the west of New Orleans and just south from Baton Rouge. So it's not like everyone's getting missed today. We have isolated flash flooding and severe weather. Bill Karens, thanks for tracking it all. I'm sure we'll be talking again later this week, given that heat. Appreciate it. Coming up, disgraced influencer Andrew Tate just indicted overseas. We'll tell you where and what police say he did coming up. Plus, Pennsylvania's governor says there's a new reopening date for that collapsed section of I-95. Where do you hear when it is? Coming up. So this really popular pizza company says you now can get delivery without giving them an actual delivery address. We'll explain in the five things. But first, investigators think lithium ion batteries are behind a fire that killed four people in Chinatown in New York City at an e-bike shop. The FDNY says it was an accident. This battery ignited. It spread to the first floor, the, then the apartments above. But the fire chief stressing how lethal these lithium ion batteries can be when they ignite. Listen. 
this exact scenario where there are, is an e-bike store on the first floor and residences above and the volume of fire created by these lithium-ion batteries is incredibly deadly. Police say two other people are hospitalized in critical condition after this fire. Rahima Ellis is joining us now. And Rahima, New York has tried to put in place safety standards, right, for these kinds of lithium ion batteries that are in, like those e bikes you see all over cities in New York, DC, elsewhere. Yeah, for sure. And this is devastating to so many families. So back in March, New York City's Mayor Adams, he did say it's time for them to do something. Take a look at the full screen here we have for you about what he's saying. And this is all about creating a task force that's focusing on this, identifying high-risk situations and fire code um, of violations. In addition, they want to go about increasing public education efforts about the dangers of these lithium batteries because, according to the fire department, once they have, it's not a slow burn, it's an explosion, and people barely mm. have a time, an opportunity to get away from these deadly fires. Hallie? How rare are they? Well, not rare enough because too many people mm. are dying. The mayor has been talking about the need to educate people again and saying that um, in New York City, what they've done, you can see a full screen here on this, there have been over 100 fires and 13 deaths. And that's just in this year alone, and that's according to the fire department. You point out this is not just happening in New York City. The Federal Consumer Protection Safety Commission is planning on a meeting next month because they want to talk about this because on their website, they point that out that in a nearly a two-year period, there have been over 208 reports in 39 cities of these batteries catching fire, and it's been deadly, causing at least 19 deaths. Hallie? Rahima Ellis, thank you very much for that reporting. So today, for the first time ever, we are seeing this partnership between California and big name stores to stop a multi-billion dollar group of thefts. They're trying to stop things like this, right? These so-called smash and grabs that we've reported on. We've seen them. Look, remember this one? This one kind of went viral, jewelry store. Thieves take what they can take, then they get out, then they go, and a lot of them sell it online. Well, California's attorney general tells Miguel Almaguer that it's a big issue in that state. Watch. We're seeing more and more of it, and we're seeing it go viral, you know, publicly, some of the incidents. So it's a, it's a challenge throughout the nation. Los Angeles and San Francisco are two of the three cities that see the most of this kind of thing. It's called organized retail crime. With California's Highway Patrol saying it's opened nearly 1,300 investigations related to it since 2019. Here's Miguel with more. Hey, Hallie, those violent and dangerous scenes often captured on surveillance video are chaotic, but they're also often the coordinated work of organized retail crime from high end luxury items to everyday products. What's stolen in those smash and grabs, which are carried out nationwide, often end up for resale on well known marketplaces. Now, Rob Bonta, California's attorney general, is announcing a new partnership between major retailers and distributors like Amazon, Meta, and eBay to better track and identify stolen products to help prosecutors with evidence and ultimately prevent the sale of stolen goods. Merchants lost nearly a hundred billion dollars last year to organized retail crime. Here's what the state AG told me earlier today. By uh, opening up uh, the black box to see what's inside and being able to grab information and pin down who's doing what, uh, where do they get the items, where are they reselling it, uh, we can get, you know, hold accountable those who are involved. Striking back against those smash and grabs and organized retail crime is going to be a tough task, but in the end, it should help consumers who pay a premium for items marked up after retailers lose money on stolen goods. Hallie? Our thanks to Miguel Almaguer for that reporting. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the Pennsylvania governor says he thinks that that collapsed portion of I-95 could reopen as soon as this weekend. That's about a week earlier than they first thought. He said that's because crews have made a lot of progress. He said tremendous progress. It's only temporary though, right? This isn't the full rebuild. You gotta have the gap filled over, paved, a new detour has to be built, then they go in and replace the overpass. Either way, though, at least a temp solution coming up soon. Number two, the CEO and chairman of Alibaba, that Chinese tech company, is stepping down months after the company announced the biggest restructuring in its history. One of its co-founders will step in as CEO, and Joe Tsai will be the new chairman. He helped found the company back in 1999. He also owns the Brooklyn Nets. 
Number three, one of former President Trump's allies might lose his law license over his push to overturn the 2020 election. Disciplinary hearings for John Eastman are starting today in California. He's facing charges related to allegations. He tried to push this conspiracy theory to try to help Donald, turn, Donald Trump overturn the election. Prosecutors say he also spread false information about election interference. Number four, Gannett, the publisher of USA Today and some other papers, is suing Google for its ad practices. The federal lawsuit says the tech giant essentially dominates online ads, making it tough for prosecutors to turn, for publishers rather, to turn a profit. Number five, you know we talked about that pizza company launching a delivery service where you don't even need a delivery address? That's a Domino's. What it's gonna do, use the location of your phone. So if you're at the beach, you're at a park, or maybe like outside your office, you'll just be able to get it right to you. You'll also be able to track the location of your delivery driver so you know exactly when your pizza is set to arrive. Noodle on that. When we come back, the Paris Olympic headquarters getting raided by police in this corruption investigation. Why well, that's given some folks a little deja vu. Next. The executive director of the Olympics tonight says there's every reason to feel confident about the 2024 games, even though police have now raided the headquarters of the Paris Olympics. That's right. They carried out these searches as part of a couple of corruption investigations at the 2024 games. Why? French prosecutors point to possible conflicts of interest, embezzlement, maybe favoritism connected to the contracts the Olympics is handing out. Officials are also looking at the headquarters of several private companies who have received some of those contracts. A spokesperson for the games confirmed this police investigation, telling NBC News, Paris 2024 is cooperating fully to facilitate the investigations. Keir Simmons is joining us now. It sounds sort of bizarre that the headquarters of the, of the Paris Olympics is getting searched by police here. What, what kind of stuff are we talking about? Do we think yeah. it'll have any effect on the games itself? Yeah, and it's so disappointing, isn't it, Ali? Because uh, we were so excited a year, year to go, uh, the first game since COVID yeah. in Paris of all places, uh, blue skies, summer games, and now this, this police raid, which, you know, honestly just seemed to come out of nowhere. It looks like some folks knew about it. One French newspaper today talking about the fact that there had been this investigation, some of which people weren't didn't really know about, or maybe it just wasn't on your radar. Let's just take a look at that. So in 2017, there's this suspected embezzlement of public funds and an allegation of favoritism, and then a concerns over an unspecified contract. They, they're forward to 2022, um, and there's talk of a suspected conflict of interest and favoritism uh, involving several contracts uh, for Olympic, Olympic uh, facilities. So, you know, we've known that there's been unhappiness. Uh, there has there's even been a, a high-level recent resignation just, just a month ago uh, with the uh, Olympic Organizing Committee for Paris uh, 2024. Uh, but now this has burst out into the open, uh, Ali, with these uh, police raids. Uh, now, clearly, it's still an investigation. Th That's there right. are, there are, there's no charges at this stage. We, we don't know exactly right. where this will land. And there is always controversy for it before an Olympics, but <laughs> here we are again. There's controversy before an Olympics. Well, you talk about the controversy before the Olympics. This is the third straight summer games to have a corruption investigation. You talk about, and I think rightly, Keir, it's an investigation. We don't know the outcome of the investigation yet. We right. don't want to prejudge, prejudge that. At what point does there become a reputational issue, right? Just even the fact that these investigations are happening. Uh, yeah, good question. And at what point does this start to become a problem for the reputation of uh, President uh, Macron, who yeah. already isn't exactly loved by the French people? I mean, he's in his, sec he's in his second term. Uh, very few French presidents are loved by the French people, especially in their, in their second term. Uh, but, you know, he has seen these games as crucial to his career, if you like. They're going to be happening towards the twilight of his uh, presidential uh, run. Uh, and he uh, was determined determined to ensure that corruption uh, was not part of, of these, these games the way they were in the past. Let's just look at, take
take a look at that. I mean, you remember uh, back in Rio in 2016, there were those vote buying allegations. Uh, and then uh, with Tokyo 2020, which of course didn't happen in 2020, 2021 because of uh, COVID, uh, there was a corruption investigation. A, an official was actually arrested by the police there. Uh, so th there has been this history, particularly, and I mentioned Rio, particularly around this question of whether everything is fair in terms of the bidding for a games. Uh, that doesn't appear to be what's being alleged here. It's more this time, yeah. it seems, to do with what happens when the games are being being uh, put together, you know, where the contracts go. That's right. Uh, but it's, it's not great, is it? It's not a great way to, 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 to celebrate, you know, 12 months to go. I, I got to tell you, Kira, I don't know. I know you just were part of that celebration. Um, we're going to be watching this one, of course, as the games get closer. Kira Simmons, live for us from overseas. Thank you, Kira. Appreciate it. That's right. Coming up, a major first from an influential group of public health experts, why they say all adults under the age of 65 should get screened for anxiety. Catholics around the world are telling the Vatican to welcome women into decision-making roles. And a call for, I'm quoting here, radical inclusion of the LGBTQ plus community. This is after an unprecedented survey of Catholics all around the world. It's going to serve as the basis of a big meeting for the church in October. Leaders are going to go over the challenges the church is facing with this document, this survey, also flagging worries that the sex abuse scandal in the church has had an impact on the credibility among worshipers. NBC News Vatican analyst Christopher White joins me now. Chris, thank you for being with us live from Rome. Uh, the, the view, I'm sure, is lovely out one of your windows in your, in your house there overseas. Um, help us understand this, because the idea of the Catholic Church and the gay community, there's a lot here, and there was obviously a lot in this survey about that, right? That's right. I mean, th this document that came out today is the result of a three-year listening process that's taken place in every continent around the globe. And one of the major themes that has come back time and time again is saying, if the Catholic Church wants to have a relationship in the modern world, it has to reckon uh, with its relationship with the gay community and also with the role of women. So it's putting all this on the table for a big discussion at the Vatican for a month-long meeting in October. Is, I wonder if this stat that I'm about to talk about with you plays into that, right? This recent Gallup polling that shows that overall church membership in the United States is down, but especially for the Catholic Church. It's gone down something like 18 percent in about the last two decades here. Is this in some ways about Catholic leaders looking to bring people back into the fold? Yeah, I mean, if you read the document, it's 60 pages. It's an extensive document that addresses a ton of issues, not just about women and LGBTQ issues, but, you know, those are the issues that surface time and time again. And the, the, the language that it uses is that, you know, the church in the modern world today, and it talks about an urgency for radical inclusion. And these are the hot button issues that we all hear about, uh, and they've made their way to the, to the Pope's desk. Uh, and so the Pope is going to convene this big meeting, and we'll see what comes out of it. The Catholic Church, of course, is reluctant to change. It's a, an archaic institution. But what mm, we've seen over the right. last 10 years is the Pope trying to bring the church into the modern world and being unafraid to answer and address questions that a lot of Catholics in everyday life uh, have. Chris White, thank you very much. Live for us from Rome. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here is some of what they're watching in a new segment we call The Global. Out of Romania, officials there say the disgraced influencer Andrew Tate and his brother are going to face trial on rape and human trafficking charges. You remember that Tate, his brother, and two other people have been under house arrest there since December. They deny the allegations. No word yet on when a trial may start. Out of Estonia, lawmakers approved a plan to allow same-sex marriage starting next year, meaning it now becomes the first country in Central Europe to legalize same-sex marriage. Most Estonians support it, according to a poll out this year, although more than a third of people there think that, in their view, homosexuality is not acceptable. And Taylor Swift, well, she is going global. That's why she's in the global. She's announcing dozens more stops for her Eras tour next year. From February through the end of summer, she's going to go to Europe, the UK, Japan, Australia, and Singapore. So if you are not yet sick of Taylor Swift, if you want more Taylor, you are in luck. Plain right away. So listen, for the first time ever, there's this public health panel recommending that all of us, every adult under the age of 65, 
get screened regularly for anxiety and depression, even if you don't have symptoms. It's a big deal, right? This means routine mental health screening for everybody, not at a therapist's office, at your doctor's office, at your regular checkup. I want to bring in Dr. John Torres, who is joining us now for more on this. Um, Dr. John, the timing here is important because there's been an uptick in people who have reported feeling stress, anxiety, et cetera, right? There's a timing nexus. And Hallie, that's exactly correct, and that's why the USPSTF is actually making these guidelines right now, because they are saying it is time to address this, and it's time to address this at a level where most people end up in hot, in medical care, not necessarily a therapist, because therapists are hard to come by, and it's easier to get to your primary care doctor, but up until now, the screenings have usually been you know, high blood pressure, cholesterol, cancer-type screenings, and now they're saying, in addition to depression screening, which was a recommendation from a few years ago, they're saying now we need to include anxiety screenings as well well and do that for all adults 64 and below. They're also piggybacking on a recommendation earlier last year on screening children for anxiety as well. So this is becoming a problem that they are addressing and one that they understand is becoming more and more uh, of an issue as time goes on here and something that we need to make sure we take care of early because early treatment means more successful treatment, Hallie. It is guidance. It is not mandatory. Is it your sense that doctors will embrace this, Dr. John? Because we already understand that doctors feel under a lot of pressure in these regular checkups, and I'm talking about a primary care doctor, to, like, get everything in that they need to get in, right? There's a lot they got to do. A lot of them don't have a lot of time to do it. And there is a lot they have to do, and there's not much time they have to do this. And part of this has to do with insurance and reimbursements. But now that USPSTF has recommended these guidelines, insurance companies should be covering them, much like they do the other screening tests. And the thing to remember is this is simply a screening test. And it's going to ask some simple questions. You know, are you having more anxiety in your life? Are you having a hard time handling that anxiety? Do you feel like you're, you're having more irritability in your life? These types of questions they can ask on simple forms before you even get to the doctor. These are just screening tests. They're not diagnostic. And so then the doctor can take that and say, okay, now we need to look further down this and either get you treatment or get you to somebody who can treat you as a therapist. But again, screening more people means you're going to find more of this. And they think that we're only at the tip of the iceberg right now, that there are many more people out there with anxiety that is affecting their lives that we need to make sure we address, Hallie. Um, can you explain the difference, Dr. John? There is, there is what is medically diagnosable as anxiety, and then there's just being really stressed a lot, right? Exactly. We all have stress in our lives. That's just the nature of living day to day. But at the same time, anxiety gets to that point where you have that stress in your life and you're not able to handle it as well as you could have handled it before. And it's actually affecting your life. It's affecting your daily activities. It's affecting your outlook on life. It's affecting a lot of things. And that's when it needs the treatment. And so the difference there being, yes, the stress that we have every day that we can handle. And all of us can get to that point where we get the stress that it's harder to handle and we're having difficulties with. And that's what the screening is looking for. Are you at that level and do you need that extra help, that extra care in order to make sure that it's not affecting your life, Hallie? Dr. John Torres. Dr. John, thank you very much as always. Appreciate it. Still to come, you might have heard of RFK Jr. because of his family, but he's also a Democratic candidate for president and a pretty big deal in the anti-vax movement. What our reporter who talked with him for a new profile says was pretty unsettling about their conversation. That's coming up next in tonight's Backstory. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight it's a look behind the curtain at this new profile of Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the Democratic candidate for president out in New Hampshire tonight, set to talk about foreign policy. If you recognize his name, well, it's because you recognize probably the Kennedy name, right? He's a member of one of the country's most famous political families. His uncle is President John F. Kennedy. His father, a New York senator and U.S. Attorney General. RFK Jr. is also an environmental lawyer, a well-known one. He helped lead the effort to clean up the Hudson and New York City watershed. But today, he's also known as a big leader in the anti-vaccine movement. As you can see here, he's trying to take on President Joe Biden in the Democratic primary, an incredibly uphill battle, of course, but there he is polling at about 17 percent. He's picking up voters on the right and left, which is why we're taking a look at what an RFK Jr. administration would look like, straight from the candidate himself, in a new interview with NBC's own Brandy Zadrosny. He would order childhood vaccines to go through constant safety studies, to go through even bigger clinical trials. He would gut agencies, remove funding from agencies like the FDA, the NIH, the CDC. 
He would also ask the Justice Department to investigate the editors of medical journals and the publishers of these journals for, in his view, lying to the public. Brandy joins me now. Brandy, thank you so much for being here. This segment is all about kind of behind the scenes and how this, how this piece comes together. You took a hike with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. out in California. We just showed some of the pictures there. You have written that it was like a decade in the making. You've asked for interviews with him before. He has turned you down. There are some complaints that maybe from, I think, people on the left that he gets too much airtime here. He is a presidential candidate. Can you talk through your thought process here, making the request for the interview, why you felt it was important to tell this story here? Yeah, thanks for having me, Holly. I love this segment. Um, so we, uh, I first reached out to, to RFK, as I've done many times before, and he has um, said no many times before. But I reached out to him because I was watching his campaign and listening to his kickoff speech, and I was looking at his website, and suddenly I didn't see the word vaccines anywhere. And that's like basically the president of Ford Motor Company coming out and not saying the word car. So it was like, what, what's happening here? What's going on? And it seemed to me that he was trying to make himself more palatable, that this was a strategic move because Democrats don't, um, Democrats do really love vaccines generally. Polling among Democrats shows that they think vaccines are safe and effective. So it's kind of hard to run for president um, of, you know, in the Democratic ticket when you um, don't align with your party in that way. So he's not saying it as much. So I reached out and I was really surprised that he said yes. And um, even in a sort of um, strange setting, I said, yes, I'll be on the hike. So, you know, I went and I think I hear that a lot, right? Like we shouldn't give him attention. We shouldn't platform him. That's crazy. You know, we've passed the point where it's an option to ignore this man. You know, I think we passed it years ago because whether you like it or not, you know, Kennedy is here and people are listening to him. He was just on Joe Rogan's podcast last week where it reached millions of people. He was trending all weekend long. Right. And so, you know, I, our job isn't to gatekeep as as journalists. You know, I think everybody yeah. should go listen to that Joe Rogan show, actually. Our job is to explain and add context and, you know, to explain the stakes and ask tough questions that make those stakes really clear. And we've seen what the anti-vaccine movement can do. Millions of lives lost to COVID, um, eradicated diseases like polio and measles coming back. So I, I feel like we I feel like we ignore him at our own peril. You know, I was struck by so many details from your stories, Brandy, but one of them that a university researcher uh, texted you, hashtag gamma, give America measles again, when you asked about what an RFK presidency or candidacy would look like here because of sort of where he is in the vaccine skeptic movement. You talk about, you know, holding truth to power in some ways, trying to combat misinformation. You did that a little bit in this hike. I mean, you talk about this in this hike slash interview, going back and forth with him about what's true, what's not about COVID and vaccines and everything else. And at one point you write that the conversation felt unsettling to you. Explain that. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think that I talk to a lot of conspiracy theorists, right? And, you know, internet adult people, and I consider um, Kennedy Jr. to be uh, both of those things. But, you know, what's unsettling about it is, again, I've covered this man for a decade. And when you go to these anti-vaccine marches, you see hundreds and thousands of people who are just enamored with him, right? They believe whatever he says, um, especially women who for decades in the anti-vaccine movement have just like hung on his every word and taken everything that he said as like gospel. You know, he's done a lot of real harm. So just being, I've never met him before. So, uh, you know, being side by side with him and asking him these questions, you know, what I what sort of struck me is that he really believes all of these things. There's a delusion there. And, um, you know, I, I think that, that that's a little dangerous. You know, I let myself for a second imagine what he would do as president, you know, and just like you said, he'd got those agencies. He would not prioritize vaccines for the next pandemic, which will happen. He'll investigate scientists and medical journals. You know, the odds are low that he's going to win, but the stakes are really high. And I could really feel that on the mountain. Brandy Zadrozny, thank you so much for sort of pulling back the curtain and giving us a sense of your thought process as you went about this profile. Folks can read it on NBCNews.com. Brandy, thank you as always. Appreciate it. That's a wrap for this hour and for the one before it. If you missed any of it, catch up on the latest reporting and newest interviews from our team. You can find us anytime in so many places, including Peacock, Hulu, YouTube. Just search Hallie Jackson now. Thanks for being with us. Top Story picks up our coverage right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.